name is Zach, if you don't know me. <laughs> it is also if you do know me. Uh, I'm a grad student in the Department of Pure Math. This is the Pure Math grad student colloquium. So three times a term we have uh, somebody from the department talk to us about something of interest, either research or something else. Today, we're lucky enough to have Jitendra here. Thank you. <laughs> offer your algebras in the context of quantum information. And today, he's talking to us about Bell's theorem. Thank you, Zach. Well, uh, this is a colloquium in pure mass, but um, my topic is slightly applied. I mean, it's more physics than maths, it will seem like, but, um, but still, you know, physics has a lot of motivation in um, new branches in mathematics, so um, it will be a good idea to know something um, on physics which might help in maths. So um, today I will be speaking about um, what we call Bell's theorem. Of course, it's not based on Jason Bell's name. <laughs> well, that's, 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 that's at least what Wikipedia says, so I'll believe that. Um, so what does it say? So loosely, it starts, um, so the story starts in uh, when, when quantum mechanics was a new, new area and uh, people were actively uh, studying what does quantum mechanics say uh, and how we can interpret in, in physics. So a um, lot of people were, for example, a lot of people, I mean to say Einstein, for example, was uh, troubled by quantum mechanics even though he was, uh, he, he was, a, he was, he had, you know, strong uh, uh, contributions in quantum mechanics. Uh, but he was, uh, he was against the interpretation of quantum mechanics in the sense that he thought that perhaps quantum mechanics is not um, a true story of nature. So he had some reservations, but there were other people that who thought that uh, quantum mechanics is the way nature operates, even though we cannot uh, make um, complete sense out of it. So uh, Einstein, together with um, together with Rosen and Podolsky, he uh, he wrote a paper, it was basically a thought experiment, uh, outlining, uh, he, he basically wanted to argue that um, there, there are some, some variables um, which are kind of hidden, and perhaps if we know about, more about them, then we can fully understand quantum mechanics. And Bill's theorem later on, uh, maybe I think um, after 30 years, he showed, uh, so Bill, Bill, uh, Bill basically proved that um, there are no such kind of hidden variables, even though we do not know if uh, there are any or not. So this is basically the loose, uh, um, the, the topic that uh, I will try to present today. So let's begin with uh, some preliminaries that we will need, which are very modest, and hopefully a lot of, a lot of you will be aware of these things. <clears throat> so first of all, whenever I say Hilbert space, you can safely think of uh, a finite dimensional space CN. And uh, because we are talking about Hilbert space, um, it has a natural uh, inner product. So we take uh, Z1 till, if this is an tuple and this is another n tuple in complex, then the inner product is simply Zi wi bar. Okay, uh, and of course uh, the inner product gives us. Uh, uh, all right, okay. Um, so this inner product uh, this gives a natural uh, norm, which is simply okay. So this is a very uh, familiar area in linear algebra. Um, the next thing, uh, so th th this will be the key players uh, in our talk today. The operators, um, uh, of course, we will also need operators on these Hilbert spaces. So they are basically linear maps on CN. Okay. Um, well, this was uh, 
they are, these are the basic objects, but we need a more, uh, a diff we need to construct uh, different spaces out of these uh, Hilbert spaces. And uh, the way we do is by tensor products. So I, I will not, of course, go in, into the construction of tensor products. Uh, loosely, you can think of tensor product of two vector space, V and W, as a new vector space, which is spanned by elements of this form, where V belongs to uh, capital V and W belongs to W. And um, well, I will not comment what V tensor W is. It's simply some element. The, thing, the important thing is that how, it, how these elements behave. Uh, they satisfy these two properties, uh, which is uh, basically bilinearity. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, v tensor W prime is basically V, uh, v tensor W plus W prime. And um, if I multiply by some scalar, it basically follows this rule. Okay, and of course, uh, these lambdas, uh, they are in the field. So, um, so using this construction, we can form new spaces from two different, say, uh, Hilbert space CN and CM. The good thing is that this will be, this will also have a inner product, which I will simply define uh, on V tensor W and V prime tensor W prime is basically the inner product of VW, um, sorry, V and V prime, and W and W prime. And um, because it's a span of such elements, you can extend this by using, by using the linearity of your inner product. Okay, and uh, linear maps on, if so if, if I have two linear maps, S and T, um, so let me say S is a linear map on uh, CN, and T is a linear map on CM. Then uh, we can also form the tensor product of two, uh, these two maps, and they act on an elementary tensor as, uh, you simply, it's, it's basically the way you, will, you want it to be, so SV tensor TW. And then of course you can extend S tensor T over arbitrary sums over of uh, V and V tensor W. Okay, um, so okay, okay. So um, these are some uh, these are some of the simple things that I will need um, mathematically. I think that will be the only things um, required today. Now moving into quantum mechanics. Um, I do not know quantum physics, but I know some postulates of quantum mechanics which uh, say how, how you can construct mathematical theories to describe nature in, uh, in, in, in the quantum world. So, uh, so basically, uh, quantum mechanics basically gives you a mathematical framework, simply says, you, says that what kind of rules you can use and what kind of, ob what kind of objects will be uh, required in um, any quantum physics theory. So let's begin with, so there are four postulates, um, and today I will be just talking about three because I don't require one of them. So first of all, the first postulate, postulate uh, says that what we call the state space of a system. So says that whenever you have an isolated physical system, um, anything like an electron or a photon, you can attach a Hilbert space uh, to describe that physical system. So every isolated physical system is uh, represented by some Hilbert space. Uh, let me call that simply H. Okay, so it basically sets you sets the arena where you can do um, you can do your maths. Um, next thing is that uh, it also says that 
the state of the system is so by system I will always mean the physical system. Um, the state of the system is described by a unit vector psi in H. Okay, so if you if you think of um, so if you think of an example, um, you can you you can think of um, a, a beam of photons, and um, you know that not you know that you know that, <laughs> but um, the beam of photon for, for uh, the, each each of the photons can be uh, they have something called polarization, and um, that polarization can be represented by a unit vector in some Hilbert space. So. Uh, as an example, the simplest quantum system is called a qubit. And it's nothing but, um, well, it's, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, the qubit can be expressed uh, by, can be represented by the Hilbert space C2. So that means uh, if you if we want to describe the state of uh, this simplest quantum system, you just need a unit vector, so that will look like some alpha beta, or if you want to express in the natural units, so whenever um, natural, uh, the canonical basis uh, units of C2, so here I will use that uh, E0 and E1, that's the uh, canonical basis So usually we write E1, E2, but here I'll just mention E0, E1, because it makes things, uh, makes things easier. And because uh, we want this to be a unit vector, so of course we want this condition on psi. Okay, so um, the thing is that uh, I do not want to go more into physics, but I just want to keep uh, physics to a bare minimum and just think about the mathematics. Okay. So even though um, some of the postulates might not seem, um, may not seem plausible or motivated enough, just uh, don't worry about it. So um, the second thing is that how does, uh, so a physical system will, will change with time. And that is governed by another postulate which is called the discrete or continuous uh, time evolution. Okay, and uh, I will not explain this uh, this postulate. I, I'll just say this 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 word that um, here we uh, use Schrodinger equation to to dictate how the physical system changes over time. But since I do not, uh, I won't be using this postulate in this talk. I I will just avoid going into that. So let's go to the postulate three. Okay, so we have um, a physical system. We want to do some uh, experiments on that physical system, or we want to do some measurement, m m measurements. So, uh, well, in the classical case, we know that we can simply, you know, uh, if, a, if a ball is flying in the air, we can uh, note down its position, its momentum, or whatever other variables that we want to. So in, the class, in quantum mechanics, it, uh, it says that uh, all these things that we can measure, they are represented by operators or linear maps on this uh, Hilbert space, on the state space of the physical system that we are using. So let me call this uh, observables. Uh, they basically give rise, rise to something called projective measurements. Okay. So uh, observables uh, in quantum mechanics, they're basically uh, some dynamic variable that can be measured by experiments. And uh, what are some examples? Uh, examples can include, say, uh, position, uh, momentum, uh, spin of a particle. So quantum mechanics says that um, each of these uh, variables will require 
uh, an operator, and that operator has to be Hermitian. Why Hermitian? Because, uh, you, uh, okay, so uh, let me go back in this part. So um, Hermitian are self-adjoint operators. So um, they are basically those operators, such that if you take the adjoint, you get back the same operator. Now, uh, uh, in physics, uh, I think they make a distinction between Hermitian and self-adjoint, but here we will just use them interchangeably. OK. Um, all right. So uh, the postulate 3 says that uh, for each of these uh, different variables, you can attach a, and, uh, you can attach a, a self-adjoint operator. And why a self-adjoint operator? Because uh, from linear algebra, you know that Whenever you have a self-adjoint operator, its eigenvalues are always uh, real numbers. And real numbers are the things that we can uh, sort of measure in uh, labs. So that's the uh, very loose motivation why we use a self-adjoint operator. OK, so um, uh, observables are represented by, by uh, self-adjoint operators. OK. OK, so uh, the thing that I was talking about is that uh, now self-adjoint operators will have uh, real eigenvalues. So if you remember, the spectral, decom spectral decomposition says that if I have uh, an operator t, uh, say it's going from Cn to Cn, OK, and this is a self-adjoint and it corresponds to some observable. Well, uh, one, could ask, one could ask this question that what, what uh, self-adjoint operators correspond to observables. Um, I think that's a totally different story which I do not know about. <laughs> but here, I'll just assume that it corresponds to some observable. Um, then uh, one can write T as, as sum of projections. Well, they are not exactly some projections, but um, multiplied by the eigenvalues. So it's basically the spectral decomposition that we um, study in linear algebra. And um, because T is, of course, self-adjoint, this lambda k will be in real numbers. And let me call something like k1 to capital K. OK. Now, OK. So how, how, does, uh, if, how does performing a measurement on your uh, physical system change the physical system? So uh, that rule is given in the following way. So suppose psi is the state of the system um, prior to measurement. And uh, me measurement of uh, this observable, which we uh, measurement of, say, t. Okay. So once you uh, perform your measurement, you, the state of the system will change into t psi. And of course, we divide it by, by the norm of the vector to make um, this new vector a unit vector. Okay. The thing is that because these uh, these are they are, they are k many uh, eigenvalues, they sort of represent what will be the different outcomes of your measurement. So lambda 1 to lambda k, they are the different outcomes that you might expect. OK. So, uh, so Im Im imagine that you have, uh, OK, so I'll come back to the example in a moment to illustrate this thing. And because, OK, so because there are k many different outcomes that you can get, um, quantum mechanics says that you actually cannot predict which one you can get. But you can always talk about the probabilities of uh, these different outcomes. And so because of there are k many outcomes, there will be k many probabilities attached. And they are given by simply t psi squared. Oh, sorry. Um, this will be 
uh, pk psi square, where um, pk is the projection onto the uh, eigenspace of uh, that kth eigenvalue. Okay, one till capital K. All right, so um, now uh, because, we, uh, because we do not know which, which of the uh, outcomes we might get uh, before, the, uh, before doing the measurement, one can talk about, um, okay, so what will be the average value um, of different outcomes if you perform the measure, uh, if you perform this experiment over and over again. So that is, that is captured by this quantity called the expectation value of, um, of your observable, which you can say, which is basically the mean. Um, so this is, if you think about it, it's just the product of the probabilities times the outcome that you, the, that you, you might get. So pk is the probability that uh, probability that you get outcome lambda k. Now, if you replace pk with uh, pk psi, uh, pk psi and the norm of that squared, then you can see that it's uh, basically pk psi, pk psi, and of course lambda k. And if you do some simple algebra uh, by taking all uh, by taking uh, taking a joints, you will simply get uh, lambda k pk uh, psi psi, which simplifies too because lambda k, summation of lambda k pk is simply your t. So that is simply t psi psi. So that means if you perform a measurement, then um, sort of the expected value of that measurement will be given um, by your inner product t psi psi. Okay. So, any questions so far? Okay. So, let, uh, so let me talk about a simple example which might illustrate this thing. So, um, one of the simplest um, dynamical variable that we are interested in is the spin of, of uh, say, an electron. And uh, you might be knowing that um, electrons are either spin up or spin down, like that. So, okay. So the spin of the uh, spin of the electron uh, is uh, captured by the observables, which uh, are called as polymatrices. So the polymatrices uh, these represent uh, observables corresponding to. A spin uh, along the x, y, and z axis. And how they are given? Um, we have sigma x is 0, 1, 1, 0. Sigma y, this is uh, 0 minus i, i, 0. And sigma z is uh, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So uh, you can see that uh, for all of these three matrices, uh, the eigenvalues are plus 1 and minus 1. So that means whenever you measure, you will either get spin up or spin down kind of situation. Okay. Uh, more generally, you can talk about, so sigma x basically means that uh, you're measuring the spin uh, along the x axis, sigma y is along the y, and sigma z along the z axis. So more generally, we can talk about spin along any arbitrary axis, and that is represented um, spin along uh, some axis where V is an R3. So you can, that is represented by uh, V dot sigma, and we define it to be simply V1 sigma X plus V2 sigma Y plus V3 sigma Z. So um, yeah, because all of these are self-adjoint operators, so you can see that uh, and these are real numbers because V1, V2, V3 are real numbers, you will see that this is also self-adjoint. So that also gives us a, a valid observable. Okay, and um, you can also check that uh, V dot sigma will have um, eigenvalues either plus one or minus one. Okay, 
So moving on to my postulate four, um, postulate four uh, dictates how you, you can, um, you can uh, deal with uh, two or more systems. So here we are, we are just talking about one system, but postulate four says that how you can view all, if you have multiple systems, how, how you can view them in one go. So it says that uh, just uh, for simplicity, if there are two systems, so system one, which is represented by some Hilbert space H, again, we can just think about some uh, finite dimensional CN. And system two, which may be some K, um, then your combined system, which I will just say the joint system, can be described simply using the tensor product of these two Hilbert spaces, like the one, the tensor product that we define over there. And if you assume that uh, H is in state psi, and uh, maybe I'll just write psi A, and system two is in psi B, then the state in the joint system is basically psi A tensor psi B. Okay, so it's kind of, um, very natural from quantum mechanics point of view. Um, all right. And, um, okay. So let's let see how this, uh, how uh, combining two systems, uh, how, how does it work with our um, uh, measurement stuff? So the final example. Um, so suppose you have um, an observable S on system one, I, I'll just say system A, standing for Alice's system, and uh, um, this is represented by some Hilbert space H, and T, which is another observable in system B, and represented by um, that state space represented by some um, Hilbert space K. So, um, because these are observables, you can write S as some lambda K, um, P, K, where lambda K, are the eigen, uh, lambda K are the eigenvalues of S and P, K are the projections onto their respective eigenspaces. And again, you can also decompose T as, say, some mu L, Q, L, okay? So, if I'm working in the joint system, I will have, I will have to take the tensor product of uh, these two observables. Again, because uh, it's not very difficult to check that if you have two self-adjoint operators, then uh, the tensor product of those two operators will be again self-adjoint. And so that will give us a, a valid observable in uh, the joint system. And if we use this expressions for S and T, you can see that using the rules of uh, tensor product, the bilinearity that you will get a uh, sum over KL and lambda K mu L PK tensor QL. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the composition for this operator is tensor T. Now, uh, we were talking about, for example, what will be the uh, probability of getting outcome k. But here you can see that in the joint system, if there are k many outcomes here, and there are l many outcomes here, then you ha you'll have k times l outcomes in the joint lab. So here, assuming that uh, the, states, um, the state of the joint system is psi, you can ask what will be the probability of getting outcome k and l. So that we can represent by pkl. And uh, yeah, going back to the formula that we have, here we will use the same pk tensor ql applied on psi and taking the square of that um, no. So the, the thing is that uh, once you have these probabilities, you can also talk about 
different kind of probabilities. For example, what will be the probability of simply getting an outcome k? So in that case, um, so this is probability of getting outcome k. That is simply the probability of getting outcome k and l, and I do not really care about l. So you can just sum them up. And you can also talk about what will be the uh, probability of uh, getting up. So, so let me, that you get uh, outcome k, given that uh, you get outcome l in, um, in, the second, in the second lab. So that will be simply uh, p, that you get outcome k and l, and you divide it by the, the outcome that you get. Maybe I should write um, a is equals to k. So that means that in the first system, we are getting k. And here, in the second system, we are getting, say, l. So well, the, thing, the thing is that you can uh, work with um, using, uh, using this full set of rules, you can work with different kind of quantum systems that you want to talk about. OK. Any questions so far? OK. Yeah. Oh, yes. So uh, yes. Um, so yeah, I should make this comment that um, these postulates they simply say that um, uh, that what will be the framework of your theory. They these these uh, postulates do not say what your Hilbert space will be or what your observable will be. That simply comes from uh, different experiments that you run in lab. So they just give the framework rather than talking exactly about what, what you get. OK, so I guess, all right. So coming back to uh, Einstein, so Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, they uh, came up with a thought experiment, which is now known as the EPR paradox. So what they so so the thing is that in quantum mechanics you just talk about probabilities rather than actually knowing what what your outcome if you run the experiment what your outcome will be. So Einstein was bothered by this and he was thinking that perhaps um, there are other variables that you do not know and if you know them you can perfectly describe the system and um, in fact predict your system's behavior ahead of time. So, so he was concerned about what he called is as term as uh, elements of reality. Okay, and um, well, that's a vague term well, by elements of reality. So he meant that uh, those variables will be called elements of reality if you could predict them ahead of time, and you can predict them uh, well. So can be predicted prior to your measurement, which is not possible in quantum mechanics, as experiments tell us. So what he did is that his, we, they start with a joint system of Alice and Bob, okay, and that joint system is. Um, has Hilbert space, is described by the Hilbert space uh, C2 tensor C2, which is very simple. You just take two different qubits and tensor them up. The state of the system is is in this form, which is basically described by, oh, I should, a unit vector in C2 tensor C2. Okay. And what you can next do is that you can, uh, so what, what, what happens is that, um, let me see. Okay, so, so this is the state of the system and now Alice and Bob, they both perform um, this measurement. Um, let me see, yeah, the measurement along the v-axis. 
So if you apply, so both Alice and Bob uh, perform v dot sigma. Okay, so they measure um, the systems. Um, I mean, here the system will basically be spin uh, the spin in the direction of uh, some arbitrary vector v. Now, what they find is that means here your uh, observable is simply v dot sigma, and the way we have defined all our uh, postulates, you can actually show. So, okay, so before that, uh, you, we know that the eigenvalues of these are plus and minus one. So then using these uh, formulas, you can actually show that what you can actually compute what, what will be the probability of getting these outcomes. And if you do your computation, it's, it's not very hard. You can just do it on a back of paper. You will see that uh, they get zero uh, in this case, um, zero in this case, and one by two and one by two in this case, which makes sense that they all add up to one. So you get one of them, one of these four possibilities. Now the thing is that, suppose assume that uh, Alice receives, uh, so, uh, so Alice performs the computation and sees that, uh, that, that she gets outcome plus one, that she measures that the spin of whatever she's measuring is spin up. The thing is that she can predict what Bob will get in the following way. Because, um, yeah, so she can simply compute what will be the uh, probability that Bob gets uh, one, given that Alice gets one, and using the formula again, uh, because you know that when both, the, both get plus one and one, you get zero, so the conditional probability actually amounts to zero. And when she computes, what will Bob get? Well, that's, other, that's the only other possibility that remains, and that becomes one. So, now Alice doesn't know what uh, Bob is uh, getting in his experiment, but she can predict using mathematics that um, Bob will always get spin down whenever she gets spin up. And that was, uh, that, that kind of uh, contradicted uh, what quantum mechanics had to say, because since we are able to predict uh, this, this, this observable uh, in advance, it should correspond to some element of reality, but quantum mechanics doesn't, doesn't really specify um, that observable in that way. So that's why, um, uh, that's why uh, this was termed as in paradox, because, well, doing these computations tell you otherwise what quantum mechanics says. So uh, this was in approximately, I think, 1935, and later on, in 1964, Bell showed that, well, um, QM is right. So to explain Bell's theorem, um, we have, so, yeah. So to explain Bell's theorem, uh, we have to, uh, do two simple computations. I mean, like we have to understand um, what are the st what, what are the uh, statistics that we get using um, this this idea that uh, in classical physics we can predict the variable's uh, outcome ahead of time, but in class but in quantum we cannot. So th that will lead to two different statistics of how a physical system should should behave, and experimentally then we can verify which which one comes comes out to be true. Okay, so here, uh, to describe this theorem, let's uh, again go to our scenario of Alice and Bob. Of course, that means we have two systems, okay? And, okay, and uh, assume that there's another player, another guy, Charlie, and he sends, um, he, he sends a, a, a two particles, one to Alice and one to Bob, simultaneously. And the particle has uh, four properties that, that could be measured. So let me call pro uh, uh, 
an observable PS for the property S, P, uh, well, R and S here, R and S, and here P, um, let me see, sorry, this is QR and S and T. So these are four different observables that uh, Alice and Bob can measure for that particle. And uh, also assume that each of these have eigenvalues plus and minus one, so that uh, these are the two possible outcomes that uh, will show up in the experiment. Now, if, okay, if uh, these, these observables uh, were such that we could um, predict their behavior uh, ahead of time, ahead of, uh, of these experiments, then we can look at this variable, which, is, which seems artificial, but I guess um, there might be some motivation, which I do not know, but it's the same. So we look at um, Q, uh, okay. So these are the name of the properties or name of the observables. And let me say that, uh, let me just see, PQ, uh, PS plus um, PR, PS plus PR, PT minus PQ, PT. Okay, so we look at this, uh, expression, and uh, of course, because of uh, the way experiments, uh, the experiment is done, th this could have a uh, lot of different values. Uh, before that also, uh, okay, so uh, I should also point out that this experiment is run so, uh, like, like many times, that you cannot really, uh, all, you cannot say all the time that what will be uh, your values for PQ, uh, P, Q, P, R, P, S, and P, T. But the values are kind of determined by what Charlie has in mind. So for each, um, Q, R, so each value of uh, Q, R, and S, T that these, uh, these variables could process, he has a, a probability assigned to that. So that means if you run so many times, then you will see that uh, out of 100 many runs, some 15% uh, 50, 50 of the time, this gets one, this one, minus one, and minus one. So it's basically uh, just a statistics, and then you compute what will be the expected value of uh, this expression. The thing is that because uh, these, ex these numbers can only take the value plus one or minus one, uh, you can just plug in all these values, make a big table, and see that you will always get that this is less than or equals to two. Okay, for example, if I just get, say, um, if I just plug in one all the places, then you can see this, we will get one, 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 minus one. So you get two. So it's basically just a standard um, computation that you can do using a, use by making a table. So, and because the averages behave in a linear fashion, you can actually um, yeah, break it down into is less than equals to two. So this is what uh, the classical picture suggests that if you have uh, a, this following setup and you have variables that you can de uh, determine well ahead of time, then this expression will be always less than equals to two. If you run these experiments uh, many times, then you will get that the average value will be less than equal to two. Well, now if I use quantum mechanics, then let's see what we get. So in quantum mechanics, that means you have to start with, a, um, with some Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space in question is C2 tensor C2. And the state of the system is again the one we uh, encountered earlier in the EPI paradox. Okay, so that's the state of the system. And this time, uh, these four properties, they are basically some observable. And they are given in the following way. So PQ is sigma Z uh, tensor with identity. So sigma Z um, acts on C2 and I2 acts on C2. 
okay, uh, PR x and sigma x, I2, uh, S, uh, sorry, PS, uh, that's given by minus one over root two, um, I2 tensor uh, sigma z plus sigma x, and PT, that is minus one over root two, uh, the identity time uh, tensored with sigma z minus sigma x. So again, it's uh, not difficult to uh, check that all of these are self-adjoint, and all of these have um, eigenvalues plus one and minus one. So there's a scaling factor, they just ensure that your eigenvalues are plus one and minus one. So it's basically a quantum picture of this classical setup, okay? Now, we had this formula of, uh, well, I think I just erased it, of finding the expectation values of observables. And if you compute the same um, quantity over here, in this, for, for these four set of operators, you actually see that, and it's again not difficult to compute, do this computation, so just time taking, you will see that this actually, you get, uh, this is actually, uh, I guess, two times root two. Okay, so it, so quantum, so quantum mechanics tells you that uh, if you run this experiment many times, and if, if you look at the statistics, the average value of uh, this expression, then it's uh, two times root two, which is uh, greater than, of course, two. So, uh, in a sense that, um, so it's basically, uh, mathematically it basically says that these two uh, different pictures cannot be reconciled. Now, which one is the, uh, which one represents the actual, you know, uh, model of nature? And that can be done with experiments, and experiments have been done, which show that, um, well, this is not the way uh, our nature, the nature functions, but uh, it always gives um, statistics which um, violate this root two, uh, this, uh, this, this inequality. So, um, using this analysis, Bell's theorem showed that if you assume that quantum mechanics is the way uh, you want to go further, then uh, no amount of different theories which accommodate hidden variables can, uh, can be used to um, understand nature better than quantum mechanics. Okay, um, well that basically ends up my Bell's theorem talk. However, before stopping, because I think I have 10 minutes, two minutes, okay. So um, if I go back to this uh, tensor product uh, de description in the first, uh, in the first two, uh, the starting, um, I said that uh, if I have V tensor W, then this is span of V tensor W, where V and W, V comes from V and W comes from W. And so therefore you can have, of course, for example here, I have taken the sum of two, these kind of things. The thing is that uh, this, uh, this state cannot be expressed in anything like V tensor W. That means, there will be always uh, different uh, states of the system which are not in this simple, simpler form. And in physics, it, it's, it's called entanglement, that this, is, that this stays, state is an entangled state of the system. And interestingly, that's the, um, that's the starting point of a lot of quantum information stuff that people do, and that is actually uh, used to use as a resource in quantum information. So mathematically, that also tells us uh, that uh, while well, tensor, tensor product uh, studied, have been studied for a long time, there's still some basic questions uh, about tensor products that even in finite dimensional that have not been understood very well enough. And yeah, that's basically the motivation of this talk. <laughs> so thank you. Verifiable by 
Sorry, come again. Is Belster saying that postulate four, the one about tensor products of systems? Yeah. Is verifiable by experiment? Yes. So this, uh, this experiment assumes one to three still, right? Like the way Alice measures her probability that she's still Yes, yeah, so it assumes that, um, yeah, so the, uh, uh, so uh, for example, these computations, they all assume that um, all these four postulates and uh, experiments, I think, they show that um, these predictions, they align with what quantum mechanics, uh, what, what, what experiments will say. So, yes, I'm like, the validity of the postulates, I think, is kind of uh, very much, um, Tested. Yeah, Parham? When I asked about the tensor product of Jordan system, for this thought experiment, so this means that they were entangled, right? The tensor yes. Can you explain why they were entangled? What's that like? Um, or physically, what I mean, I know you said there weren't any physics. Yeah, that, that, that I said because I do not know physics. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the thing is that. Um, Um, yes, I'm like they share a state uh, which has this form. Uh, well, I do not know basically what's the f physics behind um, how do they create an entangled state, I guess. But it's kind of assumed that they start with an entangled state. Um, you, do you mean this, this one? Yeah, the, 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 Okay, but this one says that uh, Bob gets negative one, conditional on the fact that Alice gets one. So these are conditional probabilities. Uh, so that's why. So uh, uh, you can actually see here why this will hold because uh, this is basically a probability that uh, Alice gets one and Bob gets one, uh, negative one, divided by uh, that probability that uh, Alice gets one. And if you do, this is this we already know here, for example, that it will be one by two. And you can also compute this one. Uh, that will be also one by two, which gives you one. So it's just a conditional probability that you can compute uh, using the formula. Yeah, that's what I thought that this could be a question which I do not know the answer of. <laughs> so, um, yeah, perhaps um, there might be something very simple answer, but I do not know. It could be a quantum system. It could be? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, but. <laughs> 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 All right. Hi. Um, I actually think I know the answer to okay, your so that's question. It's the fact that you only care about the behavior up to a projective. Uh, like up to projection down, and so any value on a Hilbert on a one-dimensional Hilbert space is equivalent to any other value, and so it doesn't exhibit quantum behavior. Well, I mean, the experiment is this, right? You have an electron, and your physical observable is is the electron. Does the electron exist? <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah. One. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you do the experiment, you always get one. That's good. That's, yeah, that could be, but yeah. I, I, yeah, while I was working uh, on this talk, I was thinking like, okay, so uh, observables are represented by Hermitian operators, but what about, like, could all Hermitian operators be represented by, um, sorry, yeah, are, are some representation of observables. And that is, 
I'm like, I found some, some explanation on Stack Exchange websites, and which I didn't understand. <laughs> so it's kind of complicated, yeah, sorry. Can I, can I also, like, I mean, I'm not sure if this is correct, though, but I thought that, like, what is it? You look at the, this is sort of a unitary, right, in C2, or something like that. And I think that maybe we should also think about, about this analogy, that when you think about, say, in, in regular, let's say, complex numbers, if you look at the value, say, e to the i theta, right, I mean, this theta, is what you care about, this sort of angle where it is, right? So this angle of polarization and things like that. So I think that maybe this, when uh, it just happens that in complex numbers, you can naturally represent these angles of two vectors. The, the, that was my understanding, but I could, I could maybe saying something completely stupid, right? Yeah, uh, I can, I cannot. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's based in like, like first quarter of quantum information, something like that. That's, that's the okay. way they introduced it. Like sort of, it's a very natural way to think about polarization of those photons. Sounds good. 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 Well. Okay. So if there are, I'll turn it again. Thank you.